We're getting ready to um, we're getting ready to start the uh, the program. And first of all, I'd just like to introduce myself to you. I'm uh, Thomas Hamilton. I'm the AFT uh, president. And I would also like to uh, have the uh, executive board stand up and introduce their selves, starting to my left. And the uh, lady at the table taking all the names is Corinne, is our uh, VP at uh, LAC. First of all, I'd like to welcome everybody here this morning, this afternoon, as far as to go over some things that's impacted all of us, as far as like with the uh, layoffs, the restructurings, and what have you. Our main objective, as far as like getting together with uh, human resources to uh, put this on, was to retrain our current employees, those that's here on campus still with us, those that have been laid off, those and some that have also taken a uh, re early retirement in lieu of uh, layoffs or uh, reduction in pay. What we've been finding out over the past um, few months is that we've been applying for jobs, but we haven't been getting the jobs. And find out there's been errors or people not really filling out their applications correctly in order to get you into the uh, interviewing process. The union has sat down with, uh, with HR and our main objective as far as, as your union leaders is to try to get you better prepared as far as like for the upcoming changes as far as like what the district is going through. While they're going through the restructuring, reorganization and job titlements which you guys are probably already aware of, we want to give you a heads up and make you prepared as far as like to apply for those jobs, get an interview for those jobs, and hopefully obtain all the new jobs that's coming on the district. We would like to have all those jobs filled with current employees, former employees, and those laid off employees instead of having all those jobs go to the outside. I feel we need to take care of our members inside and take care of our house, keep our house in order. And in doing that, that's why we're having this seminar today. And. I'll turn it over to the presenter. I'll turn it over to Julie Kosick as far as to give you the rest of the uh, seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I want to, um, first of all, I'm Julie Kosick. I'm your Human Resources Director. I've met with a lot of you individually. I know a lot of you, a lot of your personal backstories, and I want to thank you for coming. And I agree 100% with Thomas. We had a discussion about how can we get our employees better prepared for the application process to get hired for the jobs that we're currently recruiting for. So that's the whole purpose of this. Feel free to ask questions as we're going through. And I want to introduce one of my staff members. She's a human resources technician, Helen Duran. And both Helen and Georgie um, assisted me in putting this together. And so feel free to ask questions because really the training is, is here to answer your questions and to get you better prepared for our application and recruitment process. Things are pretty um, consistent and regimented, uh, regimented in our recruitment process. So the first thing you have to do is apply. And most of you, this is just um, review of information. You can apply online, you can download the application, or you can actually come into Human Resources because we have two computer stations at the front office where you could actually apply in our office in case you have um, issues with access and don't have that opportunity elsewhere. Basically, when you apply, this is the information that you need to know. You need to have readily available your education, your work experience, and any certificates or transcripts. And so you say, well, I know that. Okay, so I want to go the step further. When you apply, you should not be sitting at the computer with the application 
with nothing but a stack of papers that you have to go through. That just creates too much stress. What you should have already prepared is a very detailed resume that it's already typed out for you. You have your high school, you have your college, you have any trainings that you've gone to, so that this way when you get to the particular application process, you're merely cutting and pasting. You're not sitting there creating a brand new document and spending inordinate amount of time to create that application. So you need to do some fore work, some pre-work, some homework before you fill out the application. Otherwise, it's going to be un, um, it's going to be unnecessary burden for you to create that as you go. Another thing is, is that as you are applying for different positions, you'll already have that saved in a Word document somewhere where you have your whole history nicely, neatly, it's already been proofread, maybe you have someone proofread it for you in the family, a coworker, someone who is good with grammar. And this way when you are actually in the application process, it decreases the time and decreases the stress that comes with applying for a new job. So create your resume. Even though we don't accept resumes as a part of our merit system until the very end in the hiring interview, you need to have that prepared in advance. You need to not have to think about, well, what is my education? What is my work experience? You need to have that already done so it can be a click and paste gesture instead of continuously recreating this wheel. So you want to give details. And so I think what's important to know is that when you are applying for a job, you're not just going to sit down and think about, okay, what do I do at my job right now? And what did I do at my previous jobs? You want to actually take a look at the class specification for a job and make sure that when you look at that class specification, that you understand what is going to be required. So I'm just going to go out here for a second and I'm going to get you familiar with our website. So everybody knows how to get to our regular website. Pretty simple, lbcc.edu. And I'm over here on the right hand side. Can everybody see my cursor? A nod is good, okay. And I'm clicking on jobs. And when I click on jobs, I get this menu over here on the left. And where you're going to find the class specs is right here, personnel commission. You click on that. You scroll down. You find class specifications. You click on that. So I'm going to click on administrative assistant. This is a good one. So what you want to focus on as you're putting in all of the things that you know and have done over the years is you're going to want to look at education and experience. And why? We look at education and experience because this is the minimum qualifications that are required for you to get through to the next level of the examination process. Okay, so what we see here is a typical way of obtaining skills and abilities outlined above is graduation from high school or a GED and four years of increasingly responsible administrative experience. So why is this important? Well, we're going to go back to the presentation here. And Because when the subject matter expert or the human resources technician is reviewing your application, they don't look at your name. In fact, your name isn't even there. You become an application number. 
They're looking at what you have filled in the blanks. And so if you have not clearly indicated that you have either a GED or high school diploma, you have not met one threshold of the minimum qualifications. Equally as important is in this particular case four years of increasingly ex responsible experience. So what you want to delineate in your work experience and demonstrate is that you have those four years. And we do accept equivalency, so say it would require a bachelor's degree in four years. If you don't have a bachelor's degree and you have some units and you have additional years of experience, we do do equivalency, but you have to demonstrate it. And no, it's not acceptable that I'm going to say, well, I've been an office assistant for 15 years and you don't give details. We don't guess. We're not going to guess at the responsibilities that you've been given. We're not going to know who you are. We're not going to infer that because you've been a senior office assistant or an office assistant that you have had those four years of increasing responsibility. You have to demonstrate that for us. You have to walk the reviewer through your story, through your education, and through your experience. Do not assume that we even know the person who's applying. You have to give a clear demonstration of that. If there are employment gaps, you want to explain those. You don't want us to infer anything. You state them out. I was attending school. I moved out of state for a short period of time. Explain those. It's better to explain them than to let people wonder about them. And what I was talking about is being specific to the classification. So, say this. Say the last job I ever applied for was human resources technician. And now I want to apply for a payroll technician. And certain things that I have done in my career meet me to the, the threshold of the minimum calls. I've had to do PeopleSoft. I had to do entry and getting people paid and things of that nature. So what I'm going to do before I start is I'm going to look at my already prepared resume and then I'm going to look at the class spec and I'm going to see what I have done and what I currently do and how that applies to the new class spec. So I'm not just going to say I do recruitments, right? Because how is that going to help me meet the minimum calls as a payroll technician? I'm not going to say that I answer the human resources telephone. I can say, you know, responsible for telephones and responding to emails and those type of things that are going to be directly related to payroll. But you want to focus on your education and experience that's going to get you to the threshold of the class that you're applying for. And do not limit yourself um, psychologically and look at things and say, I, I can't do that, I've never been a payroll technician. Look at each job classification and look at the requirements. And if you can go down and you say, oh, responsible for uh, correspondence related items, responsible for um, booking of appointments, calendaring of appointments, coordination of events. If you can honestly answer those questions and say, yes, I've done that, yes, I've done that, and they relate to that class spec, then you need to include it. Don't limit yourself from the onset. Read the job descriptions fully before you make a decision either to apply or not apply. And in the recruitment flyers, they do have a brief bit of information about the class specification, but it is not the entire class spec. So that's why I went through that exercise to show you how to get to those class specs. Because you need to look them up, you need to print them out, and you need to think you know, long about the things that you do that are directly transferable to the job that you may be applying for. So once you've gotten through the application process, we go to the exam process. 
everything that you have done in the application process is going to help you prepare for the examination process. So, is there any questions about the application? I think most of you are pretty successful in that. There's only a few times when I look at an app or someone calls me and says, how could I not be qualified for a senior administrative assistant? I've been an administrative assistant for 10 years. And I say, hold on, let me look at your application. And I look at the application, I say, you didn't demonstrate anything that you've done. I don't want to make those calls. So remember what I said, look at each individual class spec, be detailed, and don't assume that we're going to infer any of the minimum calls to you. You need to make sure you demonstrate them for us clearly. So examination process, you've already been through one of these at least. There's a myriad of ways that we can go through an examination process, written exam, supplemental exam, practical performance, and oral panel examination. Okay, so you've been through them. You know that they're rigorous. You wouldn't have gotten a job if you weren't sufficient. So how can we prepare for those? Because some people will say, well, I know a little bit about payroll, and they're good. They, have a, they have a job opening, but, you know, I'm not sure I could pass the test. Here's what you look to to prepare for the written exam. There's ARCO guides, and that's actually the name of some of the test materials that you can get from the library online. Um, websites, if you type in sample examination questions for you will get a ton of information back. This is not something that's secret or anything like that. While they might have the exact questions, they're going to get you thinking in the direction and preparing in the direction for a written examination. The LBCC Learning Centers, same thing. Another thing that I don't want to leave out is you're going to go, before you take that written exam, you might get an ARCO guide. You might go and talk to somebody who's already doing the job and you're going to go back to the class spec and you're going to read every single duty on the class spec and you're going to create your own questions. Oh, well they require that I know PeopleSoft and data entry. Okay, let me think about that. I do that. What questions can they ask? Just don't leave it to chance. You need to, especially for people who have not gone through the recruitment and testing process in a while, you need to prepare yourself for that event. Oh, yes, thank you, Helen. And Helen says the job announcement tells you specifically what you can be tested on. So they list the testing areas, the testing areas of criteria that are going to be on there. So take some steps to prepare yourself before you come in. Don't come into an exam cold. That's, it's, that's not a good idea. Okay, and then just in general, of course, be on time. Why? Because if you're late, you're not going to be admitted. That's pretty simple. Okay? Bring a picture ID because we don't want the smartest person in the group taking a test for their cousin who may not pass the test. You've got to have your ID, otherwise we're not letting you in. The examinations are timed. You know that. You've taken them before. Um, do not leave any questions blank. Okay? You're going to get the exam. They're going to tell you you have a hundred questions and you have an hour and a half. Okay? Hour and a half, it's 90 minutes, 100 questions, about nine minutes a question. Figure it out in your head. Okay? Pace yourself. Know if you get to something that you're struggling with, maybe go on to another section and come back to it. But when they give you, how many minute warning do you usually give them? 10 minute warning, that's when you're going to want to regroup, look back and make sure that you have answered everything. Do not leave it blank. A blank means you definitely get a zero. Okay, that's pretty simple. You mark something, if there's A through D, you have a 25% chance of getting it right. Okay? So pace yourself. Figure out how many minutes you have per question. Go to your areas of strength first if you prefer. Um, but make sure that you answer each question. Don't leave any blanks. 
because that's definitely a zero and the only way you get through is to meet that passing point threshold. And you also want the most points that you can get because then when your scores are combined, it's going to determine if you're successful where you sit on that eligibility list. And as we know, if there's only one position, the hiring authority only gets the top three ranks. So answer all the questions. We do have practical and performance exams. They're common in some of these classifications. Custodians have a entire um, uh, practical examination. That's real fun. The girls come in at O dark 30 and leave at O dark 30 to make sure everybody gets through. Um, electrical, yes, you should know what you're doing. I think that's a good thing. So we have a, a practical on that. Clerical. For clerical, you think, well, what kind of practical exam could they possibly give? Well, you could be asked to write a bit of correspondence. You could be asked to prioritize things that are in an in-basket. You could be asked to develop an Excel spreadsheet. You could be asked to um, develop a PowerPoint presentation or do some kind of complex scheduling. Okay? And where you prepare for this, like I said, you're going to look to ARCO guides. You're going to go onto the website and Google some uh, sample questions, but you're going to go back to that class spec and it's going to help mentally prepare you for the subjects that may be before you on the day of the examination. So preparation for the practical performance, basically I have talked to you about this. That is the link to the class specs because you, owe it, you always got to go back to the class specs. Everything that test, that's tested is based upon your job requirements. So that's going to give you the triggers and you're going to say, you know what, I'm a little bit weak on the Excel whatever, self-calculation. Or sometimes when I delete the, when I want to delete a column, I end up deleting a row. I'm going to go back and I'm going to do the self-tutorial through Microsoft Office. Oh, and that's another one that I want to refer you to. If you click on to Microsoft Office and they have, um, they have tutor tutorials on everything. If you click on the one for Excel, literally they have one that I believe it says uh, creating my first Excel spreadsheet. It walks you through the whole thing. It's a no-brainer. You follow those step by step and it is really a, a I, would, I would say, an essential tool when you're preparing for an exam because it's going to remind you about things that you might do automatically but forgot why or how you do them. So that's another great tool. And, and Google for examples. That, I mean, really the internet, there's no secrets on the internet. You can find just about anything. So let's let's take a break and are there any questions? Yes. Hi. No. No. Oh, it, yes. yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> going back to our application, when you're filling out the application and your work experience, there is there's a section that um, says uh, your previous job title. And then uh, below that, there's duties. And then you start typing. And then it <clears throat> puts a little you know, mark over there showing that you're going way out of the box. Okay. If you're actually applying on NeoGov, it doesn't do that. There is enough characters in there to put it in. If you have so much experience that you can't fit it in, then you need to contact the technician that's assigned to the recruitment and let her know I, I wasn't able to get all of my vast experience to fit in the box and I gave an attachment that goes to this, this, and this. Because then they would know to pull up the attachment for themselves or a subject matter expert to review to make sure you meet the minimum quals. Good one, because I just filled one out. Yeah. And that's what I came up against. So, I, so what I did was I kind of shortened it, but it wasn't my preference to do that. Well, and you can always attach a sheet. 
Okay. That because uh, sometimes we have out of class opportunities. The thing is, is we don't put those in NeoGov because then the whole world sees it. There's no way to only publish it internally, and out of class opportunities are not for externals. They're for internals, and so that's why the application process is just a bit different. But if you ever get into that situation where you have the opportunity for an out of class, and like she's saying, there wasn't enough room to type all of the um, duties that she's responsible for, do never be afraid to attach something. Never be afraid to call the technician and say, you know what, um, it only allowed me 1,600 characters and for my current experience it's 5,000 characters so I need to do an attachment. Okay, make sure that we get the full picture. And chronological order is really essential. You want to make sure if you have various points of employment, you want to make sure that you're pretty clear. So say this, say from November of 2000 till November of 2002, and then I list all of my ex administrative experience. You're going to want to make sure you spell out those dates so that when the person reviewing it is adding it up to make sure that you meet minimum calls, that it's clearly there. There's no question about it. Other questions? Okay. Um, so we talked about this as well. Oral panel interview examination. Um, and I want to talk about the supplemental examination because I've seen some supplemental examinations and a few of our current employees have come in and said, I didn't know the supplemental was so important. Well, let me just tell you now, there's a reason why it's called an examination. It's not for fun, it's because you're graded on it, okay? And so when you have questions and they say, please explain to us your experience and why you're qualified to be a director of human resources, you want to put all of the information that you have available to you. Not, well, I've been the director of HR for three years somewhere else. Or what makes me qualified to deal with a diverse group of college students and college staffs? Um, LBCC director of HR since 2006. Those are pretty much non-responsive answers. We're not going to infer because you hold a position anywhere that you have answered in detail the question that's posed for you. So be, be real careful, be critical. Give a lot of information, make sure it's clear and concise. Make sure someone reads it before because if you're giving it to your husband and he says, I have no clue what you were trying to say, guess what the subject matter expert's probably going to say. I have no clue what you were trying to demonstrate for me. I have no clue what you were responsible for. So, okay, back to oral panel. Create sample questions, literally create them, write them, type them, create the questions. Then what do you do when you create the question? You write the answer, you read the answer, you tweet the answer. You're preparing yourself mentally for this process. It's not something you go in, you shoot off the hip and it's like, well, I'm really good. You should hire me. It doesn't work that way. They're grading every single word that comes out of your mouth in context with the question that's been asked. Julie? Yes. Question. Where's a good place to uh, go to get some of those sample questions if you haven't interviewed in a long time, at oral interviews? What I would do, what I did for this job seven years ago is I printed out the class spec and I made little crazy questions out of each little duty and then I would write my answer according to my experience. You can Google those online as well. You'll come up with, you just can't even believe it. And some, you know, be careful of the website you go to because some you'll read the question and you'll say, that would never be a question. If you feel that way, you're probably right because, you know, not all sources are, are the best sources. But in general, anything off that class spec, so if they're asking you about the ability to configure networks for a large or middle-sized department, you're going to want to have a whole host of information that you're going to provide to the interviewers if that question is asked. Yes? Yeah, 
and that those manual there was a slide a previous slide where we mentioned the ARCO those are standards in testing and recruitment and sometimes they can be the exact question it's not when you're talking about accounts payable and accounts receivable the field of expertise is pretty um, how can I say pretty well covered okay there's there's no real surprises you might have forgotten maybe one point or another point but there's no really oh my gosh they came up with this new way to do debit and credit okay it's pretty basic because you're not if you're mystified then you just haven't prepared sufficiently um, so this is just about going to your oral panel really people are saying really I'm gonna go to the jobs back and create sample questions for a job that makes less money than I'm making that's up to you you want to be well prepared for the questions that are going to be put in front of you do you really want the job do you really either want to be promoted remain employed or become re-employed yes then you should do it I haven't interviewed for a lot of positions this is like my third uh, since I, out of law school and I have always prepared like that um, what are you gonna do make sure you sleep the night before don't come in in your PJs with your hair a mess okay that's not going to be successful eat something dress appropriately you know if you are applying for an administrative assistant don't come in looking like you're gonna go pull the weeds in the backyard that's probably not gonna go over well bring your picture ID we always have to make sure that it's the person um, that's going into the interviews and taking tests that has been registered for that and study study you know some people say oh well I know this like the back of my hand but when was the last time that you interviewed when was the last time that you mentally prepared yourself for sitting in front of several people and they're gonna grill you about your experience and being able to talk comfortably and coherently about all of the experience and knowledge that you have so for me I haven't done this since 2006 for you it's probably a lot longer so you do want to study you do want to take it seriously yes A valid California ID is your best form of identification. It's the, it's the best form of identification for you. So make sure that you have it. Make sure that, uh, that you keep it with you and you have it with you when, you when you come here. Make sure that you know where the testing room is okay make sure that you've surveyed it and that the only way in is now to go all the way around and come in off faculty and and it's going to take you 20 minutes extra and you don't want to be late for the exam prepare a little bit of preparation will bring your stress and anxiety level because it's it's just innately stressful you're taking an exam you're trying to get a job you're trying to do well on the exam so you can be the top three on the eligibility list okay the things that you can do to prepare will make you go in with a lot more confidence and a lot more calmness to go through the exam because you're going to read something and, or they're going to ask you a question and you go oh, I prepared for that you know so it, it, you don't unless and you really people will say well I don't want to apply for that because I, I really don't I wouldn't really want that job or that job doesn't really pay enough you need to start getting used to going through the application process and going through the examination process because it is it is a process it's rigorous and if you haven't done it in a long time and you're not adequately prepared it may surprise you 
So anything that you look at and you say, you know what, I do make, meet those minimum qualifications, you need to be going through the application and examination process for those. So what happens, a lot of us have been here for a long time, so what happens if I pass all the examinations? Well then, we put all of the eligibles onto a list and it's put before our personnel commission and they approve the eligibility list and depending on when and how the list was created they're good for six to twelve months and we need to make sure that we always have your current contact information and so I would like to pass around um, I just grabbed some uh, payroll forms so even if you're not currently employed, and if you're not currently employed, mark on that. If you have any updates in your contact information, this is the only way that we, need, we know to get a hold of you. So I'm gonna pass some around and make sure you fill them out. Additionally, we have that will come around an email listing, especially for those that are not currently employed with the district please put your personal email on there. Um, we, I have been utilizing this and Helen has actually been the one that sends out a lot of the announcements. As I get announcements from other institutions, we have been forwarding those announcements. And for the people that have been on our distribution list, they've been able to get those, um, but I do not have everybody's personal email. So make sure if you would like uh, provide us with your personal email so that we can send you other external job opportunities as they come through our human resources department. Um, so let's let's open it up to more questions. Most of you have have finished with lunch. Yes. You don't know the PeopleSoft program, how would you learn that? You would probably have to go online and see what's available online or use one of your existing contacts within the department and see if they would be willing to walk you through and see how things work. A lot of people use PeopleSoft. PeopleSoft is used for time and attendance tracking for all of our regular um, classified employees, for all of the hourly employees, every faculty, every part-time faculty, every work-study student, federal work-study. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of reasons we use it. We use it for all that time and attendance, of course, for every single pay, for all of your benefits, Everybody that walks through the door that becomes employed in one uh, way, shape, or form actually has to be entered into that PeopleSoft system. That is the district's official employee tracking system. And then there's a whole nother side. The other side is the student tracking system. So those are other avenues which admissions and records, financial aid, counseling, they have another different aspect. But first go online. Um, you can probably go to the library for information too and then see if somebody um, would have the time and opportunity to talk with you and give you information about it and how it's used. Nobody, I saw a motion. No mo there you go. I have a question. In regards to looking for jobs, is there like a master website where you can look up all the CalPERS jobs all at once? Yes. You can go to um, www.edjoin.org. Let me uh, get out of here. Um, okay, I'll just escape the way I know to. I'll pull it up for you because it's a really excellent website. This is, this is a great website um, and this usually has not only um, community colleges but K-12 jobs as well and right now 
um, all of these events that are listed are northern, but you can click down for others. Looks like there's one coming up. Oh, there's one today in San Bernardino. This is, I mean, the, the resources here just on this one particular website are terrific. When you go to the job openings, you can actually, um, there's another sister site which is the registry, which is only the community college. Um, so you can just type in here. That. Oh, I started putting the zip code over there. It's probably not going to like that. And then you log in. And you can actually get, um, what do I say? Um, I'm going to lose the, the word. Um, notices, e notices when jobs come up. Are these all public jobs? <laughs> Um, in EdJoin, most of them are, although they do have some outside vendors that also advertise with EdJoin. And I'm, if I'm thinking um, correctly, I want to say uh, there are some like independent, um, maybe sign language interpreters and things of that nature that also advertise with EdJoin because they're educational related. So I just punched in human resources and here is just everything that comes up. Human resources, there's only two pages, but it gives you all of, and it's a really, really good website. Like here, here's a, let's see here, I'm not, I'm not sure, but like Aspire. I think that's actually an independent organization that does charter and magnet schools. So they're not all public employers, but they're all educational related. Um, you can limit your search criterias and you could go down here and you can just select, say you only want Los Angeles and say you want to limit it here. We're going to go clerical. Go search. <coughs> that. But you can see how you can navigate through it. You can go by region. You can go into other positions. You can actually type in here if you want. You would type in clerical. And so this is a really excellent website. And I'm going to try to go back because the CC registry is also a good website. So let's go back to home. Right here, it says sister site, CC jobs registry plus and it says California Community Colleges jobs so that's another great website as well and you you create your own account and then it will give you automatic notices um, of course there's others that are not strictly limited to to that and there's other things too because I know a lot of people that have left and say I really want to get another CalPERS job so you kind of got to think out of the box because a lot of people are CalPERS a lot of the counties and cities are CalPERS as well and so you'd want to probably go on to their individual sites like the city of Long Beach or the port um, they're also a CalPERS entity any county agency 
So you kind of want to go through and, and probably get uh, create accounts and get e-notices of the jobs in your fields of expertise. But those are just a couple. Question, I don't think so. I've, I've never gotten any. You have to remember CalPERS is actually our public employment retirement system. And so if you go on to CalPERS, you would probably be getting jobs for their organization because they employ people as well. So um, I'm not, I have never heard that they offer type, any type of employment recruitment search um, services, but um, there are a lot of websites where you can go on and get, uh, get notices of opportunities to a lot of jobs out there. More questions? Yes. As far as applying? Is no, it the faculty side is the same. In fact, um, when I got here, only the classified, well, when I got here, I, if, if you looked at my application, you would say, how did that girl get hired? When I got here, there was no online application process. And there was no, they wouldn't even forward you a form where you could fill it out where it was a fillable document. They only gave paper forms and you had to type in the box or handwrite in the box. Um, so when I arrived here, we created our own homegrown electronic application process. And then um, what we did in 2010 is we uh, hooked up with NeoGov, and now NeoGov, it's the same process for classified or faculty. You're walking through the same process. However, with the faculty, up front, they require you to supply your transcripts and letters of recommendation, so it's the same system, but some of the steps in the process may vary ever so slightly. Uh, more questions? Yes. Not that I'm aware of. The question was uh, whether or not uh, people that are currently working would be permitted to both work as a classified and work as an adjunct. So he wanted to know if there was anything moving in that direction and I don't have any information about that. I know that Thomas has advocated for that in some of our, our meetings, but I don't believe that we have any movement on that at this time. The reason is pretty simple. Uh, Fair Labor Standard Act requires that if you're working in two jobs that overtime rates would be applicable and so when you apply that blended or overtime rate it actually costs the district more to employ an already employed classified employee than it would cost to go outside and hire an adjunct and it's not just a little bit it's pretty substantial in some cases it's like forty dollars versus maybe sixty or seventy five and so it is a uh, cost and that's why at this time in our fiscal situation the district chose to say we need to look at this and um, decided that it's more cost effective not to continue with that practice. I don't understand the question. Like in a, in a and, and then they couldn't be a faculty because Faculty is considered 100%. I mean, is it, is it like a, that kind of a... Well, what the district has done is that there's only a few people that were already working um, with less than full-time jobs that were grandfathered in that are permitted to continue. But at this time, there's been no um, trend to approve new people to, 
teach. So there's a very limited number that were grandfathered in that don't push up into the overtime threshold and that's those are the people that would be permitted. Yes. Well, in the, the personnel commission rules really give us guidance on that. Um, if it's promotional only, we have to be able to certify that we believe, that the human resources staff believes that we can get a list of three ranks to the hiring authority and to the personnel commission for approval. And so that's why a lot of the examinations that you see are promotional and open. Because if I'm not, if I don't know for certain who would go through and be successful, then what you get out of the promotional and open is that you get a promotional eligibility list and you get an open eligibility list. And as long as the promotional eligibility list yields three ranks, then we don't go to the open list even though the open list has been created. And what that saves us from is having to run in recruitment and then be unsuccessful with getting three ranks and then going out and having to run another recruitment. Or if it's promotional and open, so are there two separate processes going on at the same time? No, it's one process. And then you, by your status, determines which list you go on. But it's the same process. It just yields two lists. People who are laid off that are on the reemployment list would be in the promotional group? For purposes of being um, on an eligibility, yes. And promotional, you kind of use the term lightly because some people have actually left higher positions and are applying for any position that may be lower than theirs, but we still treat them as promotional for the purposes of placing them on our internal promotional list, so yes. Julie, question. Um, for the open um, testing where, okay, how long is that good for? It depends. Um, most eligibility lists are six or 12 months. If we have a very robust list and there's still people on it, we do have the ability to renew it through the Personnel Commission. Um, and, um, but right now with the, with the job market and people coming and going, a lot of times when we go through to see if the list is still viable, we have to go out. Even though there might be a lot of names on there, they're not available. So then I doubt very seriously that you guys are going to notify anybody who's been dropped off the list because it's been six months or whatever. So it would be to our benefit if we've tested on those to check what the eligibility, eligibility timeline is. And then if the we want to be... Way, the best way to handle that is to actually visit our website every week. The California Education Code requires that we post it for a certain amount of days. And if you go on and check our website every week and you say, oh, okay, um, I just tested for administrative assistant nine months ago and it's coming up again, you have to apply again. You have to continuously apply. We don't say, oh, you were number two last time, so we're just going to put you on over here. It doesn't work that way. So the best way to do it is continuously check our website and or the websites of other institutions that you're interested in, in seeking employment with. Okay, so if I tested out as an administrative assistant a week ago, didn't get hired, uh, another one comes up, do I need to test for it again? No, if the eligibility list is still valid, it's, it's just out there and ready for our use when we get authorization to fill positions. Got it. Okay, let's see here. Okay, hiring interview. This is 
this is the same preparation that you've already done for the first oral panel. The difference is the person who's going to make the hiring decision sits on this. That's why it's called a hiring interview. You're going to do all the same things. You're going to make you're going to go back to your same sample questions. You're going to study or rewrite. Maybe you go through the oral interview and you do really great. Hey, you get number 1 and you go, but you know what? That one question that they answer that they asked me, I totally fumbled on it. You're going to go back you're going to look at it, you're going to refine it, and you're going to study it. Rest, eat, dress appropriately, bring a picture ID, study. Now this in the hiring interview, here's where you can actually have a portfolio. So your resume, you can present them with resumes, with letters of recommendation, and um, um, we often get those in the hiring interview and it's nice even though we get the printout of the NeoGov it's nice to have that visually aesthetic resume to look at versus the NeoGov copy because the NeoGov copy doesn't format in an aesthetically pleasing uh, that aesthetically pleasing way and you're able to put your personal signature on your resume when they see it, it's a real reflection of you. It's not this printout of NeoGov that makes every candidate look very similar. It allows you to put your best foot forward in the way that you do it. A little, a little personal twist on it. So I will stay and answer any questions. I think we did really good on time. I'm really excited about that. I, at first, uh, Georgiana and H Helen helped me prepare this, and I said, oh, that's way too many slides. And I said, well, I'm going to go, and, and they said, and then I said, and they said, really? And then I said, yeah, because I'm going to go on the NeoGov process and apply. And they go, you'll never get through that. So we tweaked this in many different ways because we wanted to make sure that we were conscientious of the time. And if you have questions, uh, I will stay yes. Do you recommend bringing a resume to the uh, the previous interview? The, no, uh, they can't accept that. They can't accept. They it. can't accept it. They're they're grading everybody because you're actually getting an examination score. So at that initial oral panel, you do not bring a portfolio. They won't be able to accept it. But that's why in the hiring interview you want to bring it because it allows you to put your personal stamp on who you are. It allows the letters of recommendation. It allows you to bring any certificates that you might have that's going to set you apart from another candidate. So that's the time that you want to do that. Yes? Transcripts and all that, is that, is that looked at in the, in the process? We print out the packet. It's always nicer when you bring it. Taking into consideration all the, the items, the, the recommendations, the transcripts, your diplomas. They, they review it and have access to it. Um, but again, when we print it, we're printing it on low cost black and white paper and, you know, not the nice heavy bond or parchment paper that you might print it out. Yes. That for your qualifications. There, yeah, yes. Yes. Hold on, hold on, you guys. Those who are leaving, leave quietly, okay? Because I think we still have some questions on the floor. Thrilling you about these things. We can. We're going to um, have somebody come in on Flex Day, one of the Flex Day. Georgie and Helen are trying to coordinate that right now. I believe there's one in February and one in March. Don't quote me on that. But we are going to have some for interviewing as well. Well, they'll specifically stick to the interviewing process. And you know, there are just little tricks in case any of you are going to go through an interview examination. If you get a question, and a lot of times they will give you the questions and they put them right there for you in front. Well, use them. So if you get a question and you're going blank, even though you've done a lot of preparation, a good technique is to repeat a portion of the question back because you're allowing your brain to recall the information. So if it is, um, explain to me um, a time where you had primary responsibility for the coordination of an evaluation process. 
and I don't remember the dates, I really didn't study that, I didn't think evaluations were going to be so critical, and so you would just say, the last time that I was responsible for the complete coordination for an evaluation plan is in my employment with the ABC Unified School District where I was the manager of human resources and I was responsible for it. And I'm glad you brought that up because these things are really critical. In the interview process, when they say, please explain for me all of the uh, computer software that you have knowledge of, a bad answer is, well, I know it all. I know Excel. I know Microsoft Word. I know Access. I know PeopleSoft. No. Bad answer. F. You get an F from me, you're going to get an F from most people. You want to specifically state each program that you're familiar with and tell how you've used it. Okay? This is like, this is essential. Okay? You, these are not yes or no answers. These are not, we need you out of here in seven minutes. You're going to say, well, um, since I've been here with the uh, Long Beach City College and in my previous employer, I've used PeopleSoft. And when I've used PeopleSoft, I've been responsible for all my employee tracking, their time and attendance, their payroll entry. I'm also, because it's you know a small place, I'm also responsible for using PeopleSoft for recalling student data for when my dean has a meeting and this and that. We want details. We want to see your most responsible foot forward. When you add those details, you're showing the interviewer, number one, that you know how to interview and you know the answer to the question that they're asking. Okay? But you got to pace yourself too because you don't want to run out of time. That's why preparation is key. So when they go in and they say, because, you know, what about this? What's your weakness? Wrong answer? I don't have any. I'm wonderful. Give me a challenge that you had. Nothing's been challenging for me. I've sailed through all of my career. Okay? You have to know those answers. You know? Okay. So give me a time when you had a, uh, a challenging client that came in and what did you do? What did you learn from it and how did you resolve it? And you're going to want to go in detail. You're, want, you're going to want to have those responses already written out and you've reviewed them. So you're going to say, well I can remember a time when somebody came in to my previous employer when I worked for the union and they had a gun and here's what I did and we weren't prepared for it and so after this happened we set in all these procedures and this is what I learned for it. You have to know those answers. You have to know what your strengths are and relate them back to the job. You're not going to say I tell the best jokes whenever I go to the cocktail parties before I get drunk. Those are not good answers. Those are bad answers. Weakness, weakness is sometimes I, open, for me, sometimes I overanalyze stuff. And here's how, here's how it folds out, and here's what I do to correct that. Sometimes I take on too much, so I have to create to-do lists and do that. Valid job-related responses, okay? No, I don't, you know, the interviewer doesn't care about your personal and you never want to share personal information at an interview because that may be what doesn't get you the job. We want to know that you're the best qualified candidate. And so that's why when I go back to that example about software, you want to explain in detail. I've used Excel for all of these reasons. I used, um, you know, uh, QuickBooks for all of these reasons, for budgeting. I've used it for this and I've used it for that. So then, when you're sitting next to your competitor and they say they don't elaborate on the Excel, you're going to get more points than the person who has been vague, ambiguous, cursory in their responses. You have to provide detail. You have to go back to your... You have to know what they're going to look for. You got to think about it in advance. You have to make sure that when you answer those questions, they're clear, concise, but they're detailed. It's giving your best foot forward 
in a detailed and concise way so that those interviewers say, well, that guy, that girl was really on top of her game. There wasn't anything that we asked that she didn't demonstrate that she had superior experience with. Those are the kind of things that you want. And when you prepare and study, you don't sit there and go, I don't remember the dates, but I know that I did something in 1984 and it had the word PeopleSoft on it. So those, you know, those are, and, and you laugh, but sometimes people will come to me after. How do I know this? People will come to me and say, Julie, I totally bombed. What can I do? And I run through, I run through with some of you. Here's what you need to do. Here's how you need to prepare. Here's how you fill out the examination. Um, little, you know, little tricks. You know, if your experience was 20 years ago, is that still valid? I mean, is that uh, 20 years ago I did this job and it depends. blah, blah, blah? It depends. It's better than none. You always start, you always start chronologically, okay? And why do you do that? Number one, it's easier to recall. Number two, it's probably where you have the most responsible experience. Okay? So you're going to want to start chronologically. You only want to draw on those past things when you've got a void in the, in the beginning. So say this, say I'm, do, I'm applying for a job and the director of human resources in a different area is also responsible for workman's comp. And right now we kind of hybrid it, so I do some workman's comp, but we also have the business support services department. Well, my previous job, I was it for workman's comp. So what I would do is I would first talk about my role now and what I specifically do now. We do the light duty letters, we do the accommodations, we make sure that people are filling out their transitional return to work, so I'm gonna go through all of these things. And then where I have voids, I'm going to go back to my previous employer where I had ultimate responsibility for all the workman's comp. And so that's how you create your answers for that. Uh, uh, as well, um, when I worked in my previous employer, I dealt with police officers. Well, I deal with them now, but at a very arm's length distance. I don't have the same control that I had in my previous job. So I do the same thing. I discuss what my role and responsibilities are here now. And then, if I'm going into a job that has that, then I'll go back to my previous job and give all the meat of that that's going to be related. So it really depends. You kind of got to, you got to build your questions and you got to build your resume so that they really understand the volume and depth that you're going to bring to the position. Yes. have to apply but do you still have to test no 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 if you're laid off and on our reemployment list and that reemployment list is still valid you don't have to apply for a job that you've already attained permanency in and that you're currently seated on a list however if you are a 45 percent person and you've been laid off for 45 percent you want to make sure that you have on file a transfer notice because we do not call you back for a position that is a richer position than which you have established seniority. So we would need to know, yes, I'm interested in everything. Otherwise, that could be a void. But if you are on an eligibility list, as things come open and say you were the top, you're 100% 12 months, you're going to get called back based upon your seniority hours. You don't have to reapply for a job that you've already had permanency in unless that list expires. Then it's a different situation. Yes, I saw motions. No? I, I really enjoyed this. I'm so glad that you were able to attend. If you have other questions, I will hang around, but I know that for most of you, this is your lunch break. So you can continue to shoot me questions right now and I'll answer, but I don't want... Before, before you guys start to uh, leave, I want to give uh, Julie credit for doing a great job and staying right on.
right on time and right on point. And to follow up to a couple of, uh, couple of questions that came out, the big objective as far as to have this meeting and the training was to get us those jobs that's being applied and those jobs that's being flown as far as from the district to get it filled by either the people that's been laid off or the people that's sitting in this room today. And on the other side, I want to follow up to a question and Julie answered as far as those other classified employees that's teaching and some that haven't been able to teach. We're working on that as something that your, your e-board and your negotiation team is working on back and forth as far as like with the district to see if we can get that implemented. Because we look at the fact that the students have a pathway to success and we're looking at classified to have the same thing. Well, I can be a classified employee, we can go back to school, we can get a degree and everything else, but then they're gonna say we're gonna pump the brakes and we can't teach. So that's something that we're working on. And then the other side of it, and final in closing, is that in your interview, just remember one thing, you never get a second chance to make a first impression, okay? I like that. Thank you.